All right, so today we're going to talk about the agricultural revolutions. Okay, we've already talked about the first one in class, or we will finish it up in class. So just remember there's three of these, okay? The first one was when, and this, this is basic, right? But the first one was when caveman, right, uh, 10,000 years ago, not necessarily a caveman, but uh, somebody is like, hey, if we plant this in the ground, it comes up, right? This is cool, right? So then they stop being so nomadic, and they plant crops. Okay. Now that's a very simplified version, but over the course of time, they figure it out, right? <clears throat> that they can do that and they can get to a point where they can produce enough food in one place without having to move. So that leads to the development of cities. Um, that leads to what you and I would eventually call urbanization, right? It also leads to tons of other jobs, right? So people can be traders people can be on boats and boat people to move to transport the goods like the farm goods there's all kinds of new things okay a specialization of craft okay is what that's called people have to make the tools to use in the fields right people have to build houses for people to live in so all of that happens as a result of the first agricultural revolution another part of the first one was uh <clears throat> the domestication of animals. So figuring out which animals you could use to your advantage and help you plow the fields and help you produce more milk, right? So that allows you to stay in one place, okay? And animal husbandry using the animals to your advantage, right? To survive as humans. So that's the first one. The second one, okay, is when we basically get some new machines, right? And it all comes about with the industrial revolution. Okay, so we'll get to that point. And then the third one is chemicals. Okay, so when and fertilizers and so we can and GMOs and science and we can produce way more stuff. Okay, so these things, by the way, proved Thomas Malthus wrong. Okay, at least so far that the world was is continually able to sustain the population that we have. Okay, so uh, for this one, for the second agricultural revolution, because that's what this one's about, explain the advances and impacts. Okay, so new technology and increased food production in the second agricultural revolution led to better diets. People ate better, longer life expectancies. You remember the demographic transition model and more people available to work in factories. So more urbanization, bigger cities. Okay, so this began in the 1700s in conjunction with the Industrial Revolution. Uh, there was all kinds of new innovations like the mechanical reaper, a combustible engine, a steel plow. Okay, even... Um, barbed wire that allowed people to keep their animals within a certain place. All of those innovations uh, are helping uh, create more yield, get more food. And since you have more food, then you can sustain more people. Okay. So mechanization, the replacement of human labor with machines. So machines made things uh, better and you could produce more food, right? So those are positive developments because you can produce way more food and people can be uh, more healthy, right? Okay, so improvements in machinery, and there's more on the next slide, but uh, we understand that we can use fertilizers, and in those days, fertilizers were often the uh, the awful of uh, animals, so cow poop, right? Still, that's used today. People still do that, put them on farm fields to help increase yields, uh, more knowledge of the soil, um, breeding practices for not only plants, but also for animals. So you have stronger plants that are more resistant, different kinds of plants <clears throat> that will grow better in certain places. And all of this is done by trial and error, okay, in the second agricultural revolution. Uh, improvements in machinery, an example was the mechanical reaper that was developed by a guy named Cyrus McCormick. Um, so if you've ever been to Chicago, there's an enormous building. It's like their convention center. It's called the McCormick Center. It's named after him because <clears throat> he developed this and has started his company there. His company is called International Harvester. Um, the reaper, the mechanical reaper, allowed the farmer to cut and gather crops easier, right? So you cut down on the labor, the human labor, a lot more, okay? So it became way less labor-intensive, OK, and it became more extensive farming because you could farm way more land now and make more money because you had this machinery to make your life easier. OK, so for you and I, we look at this machinery and if you look close there, you can see in the front, it says McCormick uh, NIT4 down at the bottom. That's the plow. It's not a very good drawing, but that's what they're using to get the wheat out of the field. OK. 
to them, this is a revolutionary product. To you and I today, this would be a rudimentary product because our technology and science have come so far. But because of that machine, they could produce way more food. Okay, and that's a part of the second agricultural revolution. So since you could produce more food, that meant you didn't need as many farmers to actually help grow the food, which meant that the farmers could do something else. Instead of having to have 100 farmers to plow your land, now you only needed 10. So those 90 other people, and this is a simplified version, but those 90 other people then had to do something else, which meant the industrial revolution was going on. So now factories are booming up all over the place. Now those people that used to work on the farm can go work in the factories. So what that means is that the cities grow exponentially because the people are moving to the cities to find jobs in the factories. All right. So other innovations, the steel plow by John Deere. Okay. Uh, and that's the same John Deere. And you see the John Deere riding mower, right? That's the same company. Okay. It allowed the sod of the Great Plains to be dug up easier without a steel plow. If you had to use a wooden plow and a plow literally comes to a point in the front. So like you put it in the front of, uh, of your tractor or you drag it behind and it digs up the soil for you and then you can plant the seeds in there. <clears throat> okay. If you don't have that plow, I mean, you're doing it by hand, that'd be really tough. A wooden plow works okay in the eastern part of the United States and it would get damaged and then you fix it. But a steel plow is way tougher and it, and it won't break, right? So that you can go to the tough soils on the Great Plains and you can bust through all that sod, right? If you've ever tried to shovel in your yard where there's thick grass, it's hard to get a shovel in there, okay? That's what was going on in the Great Plains, but the steel plow made that easier. So since you could pull out more land easier, you could create more farmland, right? That produced more food, not just in America, but also if you remember the steppe region of Russia, which is like in the Ukraine, they can produce way more food now, okay? We became, we were still, right, an agrarian economy. And I say we, the world, right? Most of the economy was based on farming, but that was shifting during the agricultural revolution. Okay, we're producing way more food, but we're also doing other jobs. So we're kind of going from agrarian, okay, to industrial. And in a weird way, the agrarian people, because they're getting more efficient at this, are allowing the industrial to happen because they're providing more workers for the industrial revolution. All right, so animal husbandry, if you remember this, okay, you're raising domesticated animals such as cattle and horses and sheep and goats, okay? They also become more proficient at doing this. Okay, so one of our types of agriculture is mixed livestock and grain. Well, if you can grow way more um, grain, you can more uh, grain products, including corn and feed for animals, well, then you can grow more animals. Okay, you can breed those animals. And then the, the processing of this meat, not just using them for the farm, but the process of the cattle and slaughtering the cattle and slaughterhouses, right? Now, you can make money doing that and you can feed way more people with a higher protein, right? So this becomes animal husbandry becomes uh, more and more important into the, our everyday lives. Uh, cash cropping, you plant large amounts of profitable crops for mass production. Okay. So this connects with the second agricultural revolution because now less people, less farmers can plant crops and be profitable, right? And there's a growing population. Okay, because if you remember the demographic transition model, okay, we're kind of in stage two to stage three here where people are becoming more educated. There are more innovations that are creating more food, which means that those people can go to cities. So cities are booming. And now that means the farmers that are left can cash crop and they can make all kinds of money in commercial. Remember, that's more than that's for, for tons of people. It's not just for your family. That's subsistence. Commercial farming is now a big deal, okay? And agribusiness is kind of sneaking into the picture, right? These farmers have tons and tons of land that they can do, um, at least more land than they could have before this revolution. Okay, so good things, right? The fusion of crops uh, leads to better diets for more people, okay? That leads to longer life expectancies. So in that second stage of the demographic transition model, the population is on the rise, right? Well, the reason the population is on the rise okay, is because people are eating a better diet, right? They're living longer, okay? There's more food available for them to eat, okay? So that's a positive thing, that people are living longer, but the demographic transition model is seeing this population explosion. That's going to change in the next stage, right? When you get to stage three, the population starts to go down because people become more educated, 
Okay. All right. So uh, more labor for the factories because those people that used to work on farms are now moving to the cities to work in those factories. So urbanization, the growth of cities becomes a big deal. Um, and then there's massive crop production. It, it's increased big time. Okay, and that happened because of the mechanization, because of the new things that were available. All right, so changes to laws also affect the second agricultural revolution. The Enclosure Act in England and in the rest of Europe that enables landowners to purchase, right, and usually it's large amounts of land, and they enclose that land. So the people that already had some money could now purchase more land, okay, and then enclose it. Okay, so that meant that the peasants, the poor people, that had farmed this maybe subsistent wise or maybe a little bit of cash cropping where they'd make a little bit of money they're pushed out by these bigger agricultural units right by these bigger farms because the bigger farms can produce way more food and they can kind of swamp the little guy okay so what happens then the little guy has to give up their land because they can't afford to do it anymore and a big farm that's already there that already has money takes over the little one okay so the little ones decrease you know slowly and the big ones get bigger and bigger, right? So farms become larger. The, the negative there is that the peasants get pushed out. The positive is that they become more efficient and they become more commercial, which means they're producing more food, okay? So the changes of the laws are a good thing in that they produce more food. They're a bad thing if you're the peasant, okay, and get pushed out. And again, where do those peasants go? They go to the cities, okay? Because they're gonna go to the cities to work in the factories. Okay, where there are jobs available. People move, migrate. Okay, unit two, they migrate to where the jobs are. All right, so the Enclosure Act in Europe pushed more peasants to cities for jobs in the factories, like I just mentioned. All right, so um, learning objective here, uh, increased food production. And the second agricultural revolution leads to better diets. That leads to people living longer and there's more work for people. It also leads to urbanization because people move to those uh, cities to get jobs. All right. So the green revolution, this is another name for the third one. So we're doing the second agricultural revolution and the third one in the same lesson. Okay. The green revolution is the third one. So number one was, Hey, this is the seed. I can plant it in the ground and it grows. Wow. Stage number two, all right. Or agricultural revolution. Number two is check out this machine, right? With this machine, I can grow a lot more food. Okay. The third one is, uh, some guy in a lab somewhere going, hmm, if I take this little seed and I put it with this little seed, then I get this big monster seed that's uh, resistant to drought and resistant to uh, you know wind and other bad things, and it will grow a lot more. So the green revolution is science. Okay, it's way more science, right? So the green revolution is characterized in agriculture by the use of high yield seeds. So they could literally mix those seeds so that they produce more food. Okay, the increased use of chemicals and mechanized farming. So we already had mechanized farming in agricultural uh, revolution number two, but in number three, those little bitty plows become monstrosities. Okay, and they can it even further duplicates how much food people can produce. The Green Revolution has positive and negative consequences, and we are still seeing the results of both of those. This is an ongoing thing. Okay. Uh, all right, so currently in progress, started in the mid 20th century, so like 50 years ago, science, research, and technology developed more efficient farming equipment and practices. This is technology. We just got better at what we were doing, okay? And this is really going to prove Malthus wrong because in 1950, Malthus was dead, like in 1800 and something, right? But he said, remember, Malthus said that we were eventually going to not be able to sustain all of the population right, food wise. And so people were going to starve to death and that it would regulate out. Okay. Well, this green revolution kind of punted that theory down the road a little bit. It might still happen. Okay. But we're able to produce way more food because of this third agricultural revolution, way more food than we ever thought possible. Okay. In, in at the turn of when we went, went to 2000, year 2000, to, th to the amount of food that we produced would have boggled somebody's mind a hundred years earlier in 1900. Okay, we're able to produce way more food. All right, so the development of higher yielding, disease resistant, faster growing varieties of grain. Okay, so by grain, I mean rice, corn, and wheat. These things were established in a lab. Scientists figured this out. If you mix this one with this one, then you get a tougher seed and that seed, okay, will produce more corn or that seed will produce more wheat, right? It allowed the farmers to double crop. Okay, so they could increase their use of fertilizers and pesticides. 
okay, in countries in Asia and in South and Central America. So they could they could figure this out that, hey, if I plant this crop in June and harvest it in September, then I put these chemicals on the ground and I can do it again if the weather's right, right? I can do it again. So the fertilizer and the pesticides are rejuvenating the ground, right? Pesticides are killing off bugs and insects and disease that might get into the crop, but they can produce these seeds now that will be resistant to the pesticides. Okay. So they are resistant, excuse me, they're producing the pesticides that are resistant to the pests, to the insects that would get in there. Okay. Uh, hybrids. So this is seed hybridization. This is what I've been explaining. It's the process of breeding together two plants that have desirable characteristics. And this is going on for a long time. This was going on way before the green revolution. Uh, people in Mexico were brilliant tens of thousands well, thousands of years ago and figured this out that they could make like red tortillas and green tortillas like they could mix all these together. They just didn't know the science that you could fend off drought with one of these. OK, so these faster growing drought resistant things like I keep talking about scientists. So like who did this? Right. This dude. OK, Norman Borlaug. He was a micro microbiologist, right? So I know some of you guys like biology and talk about like, you know, that's what you want to do. You want to study biology, maybe become a doctor or whatever. So this guy was a microbiologist. He, what he did in Iowa, the University of Iowa, helped turn Mexico from needing wheat to eat, to feed their people, to having a surplus to trade overseas. Okay. He did this. Um, and, and this was an example that was used around the world after World War II in the 1950s is this is what you do. Like, this is how you make your wheat more productive. OK, his example then led to the rest of the world doing the same thing. So at these universities in developed countries, not just University of Iowa, but universities all across the United States and all across Europe, OK, all across the developed world came up with this stuff. So this research was big money for these universities because they would get something here and then they would get paid for their research. That's a huge deal, right? So these people keep going after it to, to find these, right? So that's important because you'll see what happens uh, to some places in the world later. Uh, okay, so a GMO, right, is a genetically modified organism that started like in the 1970s. These foods literally have their genes altered, okay, for specific purposes, to be drought resistant. Um, to be resistant to disease, to increase productivity, right? That's all a good thing because it produces more food, okay? Uh, population growth, right? Bosirup said, in opposition to Malthus, Bosirup, remember Esther Bosirup, she said that uh, humans will find a way. Well, this is Bosirup finding a way. This is what's happening, okay? GMOs and all this science are producing more food. People are figuring out how to survive. She's right, okay? So... Uh, we're going to skip that one for now and go here to machinery. So the same thing as agriculture revolution number two, right? There's new uh, equipment. But in this case, OK, there's bigger tractors. There's better tillers to till up the land. There's better cedars to do this. There's grain carts, right, that are introduced all over the world. OK, this helps it make make it less labor intensive. So in the developing world, what used to happen in the developed world during the second agriculture revolution, during the third agriculture revolution, instead of having so many people farming, now those people are leaving the farms and go into the urban areas, just like happened in the developed world. Right. So this is the second agriculture revolution. Right. This machine is like, oh, that's amazing. Right. Well, here's the th here's the third agriculture revolution. This is the green agriculture revolution. Boom. That's a heck of a lot bigger. And if you ever stand in person in front of one of these things, I mean, it's amazing how big they are. OK, it's incredible. But this is what happens. This is your third agriculture revolution. You can produce a heck of a lot more wheat doing it this way. OK, than you can doing it this way, as opposed to the first agriculture revolution. We didn't have any of that. OK, you used a shovel and a hoe. OK, to get your work done. All right. So agribusiness comes out of this. This is a good picture of agribusiness, right? That costs a lot of money. OK, so food production goes from start to finish. OK, so this is another name for large farms that aren't owned by families. This is a corporation and sometimes a family will form a corporation and they'll have an enormous amount of land. OK, and they literally take this food from beginning to end. Right. Uh, another form of agribusiness is dairying. So that's the business of producing and storing and distributing milk and all of its products. Okay. So it says from our farms to cow to dairy plant to you. 
right? So we get our milk somehow. There's never a shortage. Okay. So there's a dairy farm out there that's producing all the milk that we use. Uh, <clears throat> positive impacts. We have way more food. Okay. Lower death rates and a growing population. So you think demographic transition model. Okay. Lower death rates. People are living longer, but we're also in the developed world anyway. <clears throat> you have way less uh, people being born. That's why we can get into the fifth stage of the DTM. Things level out. In the first stage, there was a ton of people being born and dying. Now people are living longer, but there's also way less people being born when you get to the fifth stage of the model. Our right, higher yields in the developing developing world prevent a massive famine. Right? It prevented millions of people from dying because there was more food. And people still died. There was still starvation, but not to the level that they, that would have been. All right. So if you look at those yield increases in the 40 years from 1960 to 2000, that's crazy. OK, that it, it increased that much. You can feed a heck of a lot more people. OK, that way. So it benefited <clears throat> universities and corporations because there was big money in this. Right. So these universities, man, they work like crazy. It's kind of like the, with the coronavirus, except there wasn't money on it. But universities research this thing like crazy. And maybe there was money in that I don't know about. But with this farming stuff, well, if the farmers are going to pay for these fertilizers, well, the university is going to make money on this too. So in the parts of the world where this was affected, those universities benefited big time. Okay. Food prices went down and that was a good thing for everybody. Um, more affordable for the developing world, right? So these are positives, right? So, but with positives and with anything, there's positives and there's negatives. You got to see both sides, right? So the negative impact is the damage to the environment. Those pesticides and fertilizers, well, they damage the farmland. And then when it rains, that those chemicals go into the water supply. So the drinking water, okay, causes problems. The water in there causes problems for the animals that live in there, the species that depend on that. Okay, you probably have talked about this in, uh, in your science classes. Okay, so the machines used to do all this stuff, they're run on gas and oil and it adds damage to the environment, right? Also gender roles, right? So men and women, it was seen that men would be the ones operating the machinery, not women. So that pushed women out of that. Okay, so it further marginalized the women, okay, and their traditional role, right? That they're supposed to stay at home and do this. Well, the job opportunities aren't there when things become more mechanized. Okay, and if the women were going to go work in a factory, now all these surplus of people are going to go to the city. So those women are getting pushed out of that because most of the people going to the cities are men. Okay, so the gender roles, that's the negative, right? So lack of sustained investment. What, take the guy from the University of Borlaug at the University of Iowa. I mean, that's awesome that he did that. But once they did that and they made their money on it, do the companies continue to invest? No, there's no sustained investment. People do it until they find a solution and then they're going to go on to the next thing. Like our focus the last 12 months here in America and the developed world has been on finding a cure for the coronavirus. They put other things on hold and they took care of this. Well, after this is over, right, which maybe hopefully it is at the end, they're going to push now to go on to the next thing to look for. And when there's money involved, that for sure happens. OK, so massive urbanization and cheap labor. Farming's not nearly as labor intensive. So people go to the cities. And since there's so many people there in the cities, and this has happened, continues to happen in the developing world today, there's a massive influx of people to the cities, which means if you're a factory owner, you have a surplus of people to choose from to work. So you're not going to have to pay them very much. All right. So the Green Revolution, it has very little success. So this is another negative, And this is a big one that people don't think about. The Green Revolution doesn't really work in Africa. The crops, like the wheat, doesn't grow in Africa nearly the way it does the rest of the world. Okay, so in Africa, they don't have the diversity of soil that we do here and that they do in Europe and that they do in parts of Russia, okay, and parts of Asia. So it's too expensive to develop plants, right? It's too expensive for companies to invest their money and universities to do their research for the smaller areas in Africa. Okay, the crops there aren't really affected by this green revolution, right? So also in Africa, there's a harsh environment of insects, plants, viral strains. It's tough, okay, to, to farm there. It could be done, especially with the, the science of the third Re uh, agriculture revolution, but the investment isn't there because the people don't see the return as they did in the rest of the world. So you remember the example of the guy from Iowa that went to Mexico, okay, and other parts. And Mexico was part of the developing world at that point, still are, but parts of Africa that can't grow wheat, well, 
sorry that, that they just don't get the help, right? So staple crops of Africa, things like sorghum, millet, that should say cassava, okay, yams, they're not always included in this research because the profit, the return on the investment for the people making the investment isn't quite as great. Uh, okay, so food insecurity in Africa. Food insecurity basically means you don't have enough food. Okay, today, 30% of the population is affected. During the Green Revolution, the world population doubled and there was more growth in the periphery countries, especially in Africa, okay, in the poor part of the world. The Green Revolution has had the least impact in Africa than it has anywhere else in the world. Okay, so that's a negative. Now that's changing a little bit. People are doing are more aware of this and they're doing more things to help out the crops in Africa, to feed the people in Africa. Um, and that makes sense, but they were not the top priority because there wasn't as much farmland there that could grow the crops. Uh, so here's the end of this, right? Uh, and I'll go ahead and stop right there. I'll go back here when I stop.